I'm John Smith. I was college secretary and clerk to the governors. I arrived in January 1979 and left in December 1989. I think it's an extraordinary concentration of talent, of achieved talent, among the many very distinguished academics, Nobel laureates and fellows of the Royal Society, and also of potential talent, these very bright undergraduates with which one is surrounded here. Difficult for me to assess now. I, I think, of course, when I read about Imperial these days, it's a different Imperial to the one I worked in, because most of the news is about medical advances and contributions the college makes to medicine. And I was here at the start of that with the first merger, but engineering was really our, our strong point in those days, and we were much more famed for that. Well, I, I think the college, and its name implies, uh, Imperial College, played a huge part in engineering throughout a very large part of the world. I mean, the, the people from here worked all over the world and Imperial was probably one of the best known institutions in this country, certainly in the Indian continent for example, and in South America and Africa, all over the place. And that I think was very strong still right into the 70s and 80s. I think medicine and science, the biosciences have, have come on hugely. I mean when I was here Physics was probably the, the dominant science. Uh, we were the largest physics department in the United Kingdom, 200 undergraduates taken in every year. Um, all the physicists did extremely well. They were part of the great Big Bang in the City of London because uh, the financial services were largely staffed by uh, talented young physicists. And I remember it was always a regret to me that in my 10 years here, I don't think a single physics graduate went into teaching. Well, it was certainly a novelty for me. It was indeed the first job I'd actually had in, in Britain because I'd worked overseas, I'd been in the army, but I'd never really had a job here. And while I knew the University of London quite well because I'm an undergraduate, of, uh, I was at UCL where I read history, and I knew IC, but I had not worked in Britain before, and I did find some things pretty odd. Uh, well, it surprised me that, um, first of all, within the college, with this enormous array of talent, people didn't really know one another very well. And I found people here remarkably ignorant of other facets of British life. I worked in smaller environments where most people at the top crossed one another at various stages. And I well remember, for example, uh, taking uh, the then rector, Brian Flowers, to uh, a lunch in the city which I organised with stockbrokers, I knew leading stockbrokers. And it was the first time he'd ever been to the city of London for a lunch and to, to have a, a tour of this big stockbrokers and, and realise how his language was not their language because when we went into their research department uh, the people there were not doing the sort of research that he would have expected them to be doing and that, that was a great eye-opener. Well, I, I tried to persuade people to get to know one another. I, I mean, it surprised me, for example, when I came here that people didn't know the permanent secretary in the Department of Education. I took it for granted he would be on everyone's visiting list. No, ministers certainly came occasionally, but um, we didn't know an awful lot of these people. And I did try and build links, although because I'd never worked in Britain, my own contacts weren't particularly good. And so this was quite hard work for me. And within the college, I think one of the things I, I set out to do was to get 
the heads of departments more integrated into the college. For example, the physics department when I arrived was known as the Blackett Laboratory. It had a separate postal address, Prince Consort Road, and no indication that it was even part of Imperial College. Um, I can remember being out with the rector one day and we, for some meeting, we got a cab back to the college and I said to the cabbie, um, Imperial College, and he said, where's that then? Somewhere near the RSM, <laughs> much to the fury of the rector. <laughs> but it, curiously enough, it was the parts of the college that were better known in some ways than, than Imperial. So one of my first things here was to establish the uh, heads of departments meeting, which involved them in college administration. That was very important for me because I, there were things I wanted to do often in those days to save money because we were under considerable constraints, uh, which could only be achieved with cooperation from the departments. And uh, we put matters to them for discussion which would affect departments, affect the college generally. And if we got their backing, one could effectively go ahead. And it helped to reduce, I wouldn't say destroy, but it helped to reduce uh, the feeling of them in Shelf, Sherfield, the administration, who were everybody's enemies. Well, I, I can remember being quite embarrassed because I'd only been here a few months at the first heads of departments meeting, introducing heads of departments to one another, because I'd visited them all, who had been in the college perhaps 10, 15 years and not only didn't know the other chap, hadn't a clue what they were doing. And I, one, of, one of the things I failed to achieve, I urged both my rectors to do it, was to hold a regular uh, rector's seminar. I said, why not have half a dozen a year where you get leading researchers in the college who really are at the, the very frontier of their knowledge of, of their science to talk about what they're doing to other people in other parts of the college so they actually would be aware of what was going on. But uh, I never achieved that. Yes, I think because while I was here we had uh, the whole pressure of the university system and there was the Swinnerton Dyer uh, review of the University of London and we started to talk mergers. I was quite keen on mergers for a number of reasons, um, one of which was predatory, to be honest. Uh, I was particularly keen on a merger with what was then Queen Elizabeth College in Kensington and because I thought this was a piece of real estate that would be an enormous asset in the future whether it was still used for academic purposes or simply sold on. And Queen Elizabeth College uh, was a science college. It didn't have much distinction in many ways, but it had a very good department of uh, food science and nutrition. It was well known in that respect. But I'm afraid my efforts were turned down categorically uh, by the uh, academics here who said, look, they haven't got a single fellow of the Royal Society. And that, that was the end of that. Well, they, they merged with King's College to King's great territorial advantage and financial advantage. Well, I, I, I was keen on getting the college involved in the, in the wider world and it obviously seemed to me that the link between science and industry was something we ought to pursue. And it annoyed me that there we were, the leading scientific institution in the country, in the metropolis, but we didn't do as well as universities like Hull, for example, in terms of spinning out research into actual development. And uh, we tried a, a number of initiatives and uh, I was very much involved with the development of uh, the, the little science park at Silwood 
partly because we had to do something with Silwood rather than just have it as a great piece of estate to manage. Um, and I think that has developed and we set up the odd uh, impel and impact. We, we set up one or two um, uh, companies and one of the ones which we began, it didn't succeed unfortunately, was Imperial Biotech. Uh, which uh, was involved with chemical engineering, which uh, with um, biochemistry, um, and uh, I was a director of that. But I think it began to get people talking about that sort of thing. And of course now with the addition of the medical schools, that's very big business and does the college a great deal of credit. No way. <laughs> there were still some big holes in the ground when I arrived and there were still some when I, when I left. And of course, money, money was difficult in those days. Um, we had never built up any endowment. We relied almost entirely on the University Grants Committee. In those days, we didn't own most of our assets. Of course, uh, we're, a lot of the college site is leasehold and everything else pretty well had been provided by the UGC. So we didn't have much to offer as collateral. I, I was very keen on developing uh, property and acquiring more property and uh, borrowing money to do these things. But the atmosphere wasn't particularly friendly towards that and people thought these were terrible risks to be taking, um, which some of them might have been, but on the whole I, I, I don't think would have been so. Um, uh, so bad at the end of the day. Um, and uh, the government was pretty tough. We, we had done well with a lot of overseas students and uh, I arrived at the time of the Margaret Thatcher's government uh, in 1979 and uh, they started to charge fees to overseas students. And they felt universities had a fair amount of fat, which I think nationally was probably not unfair comment, but from Imperial's point of view, we didn't have a lot of fat, and we did, we did our best. But it was very hard to raise money. And in those days, we used to accept uh, research grants without any overheads at all, quite common. I can remember putting up um, an extension to biochemistry um, which cost the best part of a million pounds simply because biochemistry was getting some extremely good, important research grants and the staff they were recruiting had to have somewhere to work. Uh, and it was an uphill task which uh, I was involved in and other people like David Thomas who came and uh, for Impel to try and persuade everyone that they had to charge intelligent overheads so that we could afford new buildings. Yes, I, I think when I arrived, um, the, the unions were very important, especially the technicians' unions. I think people in the college now would find it very hard to imagine uh, the number of workshops we had. There was something like 15 or 16 glass blowing workshops at the end of the 70s. Um, any number of engineering workshops of one sort or another. Virtually every basement area of every building was a workshop. And this was before the days of uh, computer aided design. And people needed rigs built. And there was a very large number of technicians employed, probably the largest number in any university in Britain. And the Technicians Union, ASTMS, was an extremely powerful one and the national leadership was centred here in the college. And uh, they had brought the college to its knees on several occasions. And the Thatcher government, which uh, really did bash the unions, I mean the, the great uh, mine uh, workers um, business uh, was in a sense being worked out everywhere else too and it was extremely difficult. I did my best to 
cooperate with the unions, work with them uh, as far as was possible. But they did often um, boycott a lot of things. I mean, I can remember the STMS, for example, boycotting the option of uh, having uh, membership of the um, governing body. Uh, they didn't want to be involved with management under any circumstances. They stood out against um, uh, people being paid uh, their wages, salaries, uh, through the uh, banking system. And uh, I can remember the, uh, the head of ASTMS to the day he retired still collecting his wages in cash, though he was a highly paid technician. Um, and as an administrator, I was very keen to try and get everyone to, uh, to have their money salaries paid that way because the actual business of handling cash and the security factors were becoming quite problematic and were expensive. You know, it meant three people employed picking up wages every week and all the rest of it. I wouldn't say particularly detrimental. I, I think I came in really towards the end of the real problems. I think my predecessor, Mickey Davis, had an extremely tough time. Um, and that was during the great winter of discontent, of course. Uh, and I, I, I think I was lucky in the sense that things began to uh, ease off. And um, my secret weapon was to get the unions involved in in organizing parking. And I found us, wherever I worked, parking is a very big issue. And although Imperial had an enormous number of parking spaces um, to offer, for which I would love to have charged a handsome fee, um, getting the unions involved in things like that did give me a personal contact and, and uh, a way around. There were some other good organizations which were close to the unions without being union uh, related directly. Uh, de departments in those days had somebody called a departmental superintendent who was in charge of the technical staff of the department, of whom there'd be a great many, probably as many or more than academic staff in some departments. And they used to have a, a monthly meeting, which was a bit of a social, they'd have lunch together. But I, I got invited and then I said, may I always come? And I used to always go to their, their monthly meetings and got to know some of these people. And they were enormously influential in the college, people like Roy Adams in, uh, in um, biology or botany as it was then, John Oakley in chemical engineering. Uh, these were people who could really make things happen if you wanted them to happen. And that was a, a very good way into encouraging trust between, between the, the staff and the administration. I didn't have anything much to do with it. I mean, it was the sort of thing I, I supported and um, uh, was, was keen on and um, rather like the, we used to have an award scheme, I forget what we called it, but every year for people who had done particularly good work and often technicians would would win this award and we used to have a little uh, party in 170 and the rector would dish out whatever the prize was and uh, that that did good again helped trust because these were these were very loyal college servants in in many ways they, they their whole life was spent here most of them and often more than one member of the of the family um, there'd be two or three from some families because uh, people often got their, their relatives in, into the college one way or another. I know uh, quite honestly, perfectly happily, I think, and it worked very well. They, they had their voice because one of our uh, governors in those days was Caroline Benn. And uh, she, she had a direct route to ASTMS and always um, sort of produced their views. So in a sense, they felt they were well represented in any case. Well, I, obviously, I, I, I think the, I was involved with the merger with St Mary's 
and that in many ways went well initially um, because St Mary's was a supplicant. It wasn't imperial as a predator going out to acquire St Mary's and um, I, I personally got on very well with uh, Peter Richards, the Dean, and we worked very well together and uh, we established a, a good committee to solve some of the obvious difficulties and um, that has led to bigger mergers and probably tougher mergers. I, I think the word difficulties, and certainly when I left the college, some things had never been effectively merged. I mean, the, the financial systems were still rather far apart, although that had been a deliberate decision not to bring them together for five years, so nobody should feel too upset. We would each understand each other's uh, weaknesses and strengths. But um, the unions, the student unions, uh, were still not getting together. And in those days, uh, the, the three constituent colleges of Imperial had their own union and union officers. And it struck me, fine, St Mary's can be in that sort of position. But uh, when it came to playing rugger, for example, St Mary's still felt they needed their playing fields and so on. And, and uh, some of the economies that could have been achieved were not being achieved initially, and I suspect that sort of difficulty probably still continues. Difficult to make a, a judgment without using a lot of hindsight. I came from uh, the Empire and uh, certainly Imperial was very renowned and recognised and respected. I think probably its standing in this country wasn't quite uh, the same. Um, ministers, uh, while I was here, responsible for higher education, did appreciate the, the need to be in touch with the college. Um, Brian Flowers um, uh, became a peer um, just about the time I arrived and uh, th that was important for the college I think. Not that he played a major role in the House of Lords but it, it gave him an entree that was significant and I think recognised the position of the college. Um, and we used to try and cultivate a number of politicians. We used to occasionally give them a day here, um, those that were involved in, in science in one way or another, and uh, have friends among them. But I think generally during those Thatcher years, the universities and the government were at loggerheads nationally. And it wasn't easy. Uh, we had the Prime Minister here on one or two occasions and uh, there was always a pretty large protest, um, mainly led by ASTMS and some students, but mainly ASTMS, um, if she came. So it wasn't, it wasn't an entirely happy sort of uh, relationship. I, I think um, industry uh, saw as mainly from the point of view of research contracts and uh, you know th they were bottom line people they were trying to get as much as they could f for as little as possible and I don't think we always had very happy relationships with GEC and some of the other big outfits um, certainly there were problems dealing with them and with hindsight I think possibly we didn't give uh, sufficient importance to that uh, and take sufficient cognizance of what their interests really were. And it, it's curious but I can remember very clearly being in my office in Sherfield when somebody from IBM arrived and offered us a hundred PCs and I had some difficulty finding anyone among the academic staff who wanted to know. 
uh, I, I mean, it is extraordinary where now absolutely everybody and every undergraduate will have their own PC. But um, people were still a bit dubious about it. And that's not all that long ago. I mean, this is 19, it will probably be in 1979, 1980. Um, and in the end, chemical engineering in those days probably led the college in, uh, in that sort of um, IT initiative and uh, innovation rather than the computing department. Well, the, we, we did well. I mean, we were obviously high on the priority list of bright students all over the country. Um, and I think from state schools as well as private schools, I don't think while I was here anyone ever had a feeling that there were too many private school students. I mean, I think the, you know, there are a large number of uh, state school students where we were weak was uh, with, with women. The women who came were extraordinarily able, and certainly when I was here, we had several very able women presidents of the union, for example. They did extremely well. Um, many of them coming from single-sex girls' schools, uh, where science had been pushed and promoted, and, and they, they excelled. And certainly, um, uh, Brian Flowers did his best, and then Eric Ash made it a really significant um, feature of his rectorship to improve and enlarge the number of women students. And I think he, um, he, he succeeded, and we did a great deal um, to, to promote um, the recruitment of, of women students. I think probably one of the biggest changes in my time was with postgraduate students. Um, uh, when, when I arrived, the emphasis was very much still, if you like, on the then archaic title imperial. I mean, there were a lot of um, people from Asia, from Africa, um, huge numbers. And then while I was here, it increasingly became transatlantic and European. Well, I, I, because of my own background, I, I'm sad that um, people haven't, you know, haven't been able to come from uh, those other sources. Now, I've always been keen on Britain providing postgraduate education. I, I was never enthusiastic about um, overseas undergraduates, but particularly from the new Commonwealth, because it often was to the detriment of their own universities, which people didn't always understand. Now, I've always been irritated by North American universities, which have gone out of their way to pick up um, bright students from Africa, very good for them as individuals, but not very good for their own, uh, own universities. Um, but uh, I think that we became more European was important. I always deeply regretted the fact that we didn't really reciprocate. I would have liked to have seen far more of our undergraduates spending a year in Europe. I mean, I, I personal opinion, but I still think Britain's biggest problem is that we are not sufficiently European. And it's a language thing, very largely. Um, and I, I, I can remember going to parties and things and talking to uh, undergo a group postgraduates from France and Spain and Italy speaking extremely good English from cultures that in my student days uh, would not have wanted to speak English. Uh, I was amazed. I mean, they were really taking advantage. And I think inevitably this nationally does us considerable harm. Well, in my time, uh, alumni were very much the alumni of the three constituent colleges. I can remember the Royal College of Science had its 100th anniversary and we had a great uh, banquet in the Guildhall in the city and a lot of effort went into that. Um, city and guilds used to 
have um, this old Centralians used to have an annual dinner in one of the livery halls to which I'd be invited. And the RSM had a similar uh, sort of uh, event. Uh, the college's college didn't really have anything going for it. And this is something which we, we began to get involved in in my time. Um, the registry, and Peter Mee was then registrar, uh, picking it up and, and developing it as, as time went on very effectively. But um, it was in its, in its infancy, and I think um, ignoring the Oxford and Cambridge colleges, which had fairly good networking, the only institution, university institution in the country, which had good uh, links with its alumni in the early part of the 1980s was the London School of Economics. And we all went there to learn how they'd, they'd done it. And it was one of the things we, we started to sort of dabble in without a great deal of success. And uh, nobody really wanted to put money into it when money was short. But uh, Eric Ash as rector uh, did some good things, and Brian Flowers before him. I remember he and I went on a visit to the uh, to the Far East. We went to um, Hong Kong and Singapore and Malaysia, uh, simply to meet alumni, of whom there were a great many in those countries, and uh, try and establish some sort of a, a link with them. And then, as I say, Eric Ash picked it up very well, and. Um, I, I think now it's, it's working probably as well as it does in most universities, but we're still far and away behind the, the United States in this respect. Well, many things really. I, um, I, one, and I've mentioned Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> and I, I remember this story with uh, affection as well as amusement. But during the long vacation, probably I think towards the end of July or early in August, um, and this was in Eric Ash's time as rector, Margaret Thatcher suddenly responded to a, an open invitation to come and visit the college. And she gave us about a 10 days warning. And her visit would be in the middle of August. And uh, to put it mildly, the college, college was uh, sort of enjoying its usual summer tranquility. And uh, we put together a, a program for her. She said she could spend about an hour and a half. And this meant summoning people from uh, uh, beaches, I shouldn't say that, from all over the world and uh, trying to get back some research students and so on and so forth. And Margaret arrived with Dennis Thatcher quite early one morning and uh, they went through several departments, uh, finishing up in physics and going out onto Consort Road. And um, one of the problems was that, of course, no undergraduates at all, and all the research students available were almost entirely uh, from Asia or Africa or somewhere not close who were still here in the midst of summer. And a few disgruntled academics who'd been forced to break short their, their, their summer plans. And so she made a few comments uh, as she had done before when she came to the college, why can't you teach our children to do all this, you see? But um, at the end, I remember Eric Ash saying to her, well, it's very good of you, Prime Minister, to, uh, to spare so much time to come and visit. And she said, oh, it was no trouble at all. Dennis and I are just on the way to the dentist, and it was convenient. <laughs> Which is a great, a great, a great, a great, a great put down. But uh, uh, no, there are, there are many occasions I remember with uh, with relish. I uh, several things I I much enjoyed. Um, 
we had the consort gallery in those days and we used to have exhibitions there in which I played a role and Gordon Hargreaves who was our safety officer, director of safety, um, was uh, the chap who managed all these things and had a really good uh, sort of network in the artistic world. And uh, we had a little fund and uh, he used to go, I used to go with the rector to the Royal College of Art and, and buy things for the college. And uh, in my day we started to commission a few paintings, uh, which was good. And we also decided to commission portraits of our Nobel laureates. And I remember the immense pleasure this gave to Sir Geoffrey Wilkinson, head of chemistry, Nobel laureate, um, much to my surprise. And he really did hate the administration, was always um, being uh, irritated and angry with us and all the rest of it. But he just loved this and it, it, it was a, a wonderful thing and he and I became great friends as a result of it. Uh, so that, that is a portrait I remember with deep affection. Well, I, I was, um, uh, when I first came to the college, um, I, I lived in Chiswick, I had a, a young family, and I, I used to try and entertain colleagues at weekends, but I, I realised how difficult it was that, you know, we all came from all directions into London, people, many people lived 30, 40, 50 miles away, and it was an awful burden on them to... Uh, to come to Sunday lunch or something. I didn't really like doing it very often. Um, and then the opportunity came to uh, move into Prince's Gardens to, to a flat. And I, I did this, it was very pleasant and convenient for me, but I was realizing I would be coming up to retirement. And uh, I knew how difficult it was to recruit people. Uh, to come to the college from elsewhere and I thought it would be a great asset to be able to offer a future, my successor, uh, a flat. Um, and when opportunity offered in, in Prince's Garden, where we had a lot of external tenants and they started to go, uh, a flat that wasn't really suitable for conversion to student use, um, we did up and I moved in with the agreement obviously of the chairman of the college and, and rector. And uh, once I was there I started to instigate happy hours if you like on a, on a Thursday um, evening, perhaps a Friday, I think it was Thursdays, um, where I could have admin staff and it wouldn't unduly upset their, their schedule. We used to do it just about, you know, half hour before office closed and a little bit afterwards. And um, that, that I enjoyed very much. And then uh, when I was staff orator, which I much enjoyed, uh, we always had a lunch party for, for some of the recipients and members of staff. And people like Lord and Lady Penny, former rector, used to always come. Um, and that was great fun, and uh, so we, we made the most of the flat and, and enjoyed it. It wasn't only that flat. I mean, I did consciously start to build up, because the college had little nooks and crannies around the place, which people did occupy, but not perhaps to the best value for the college. Um, so we built up um, a schedule of these flats, and so they became available for visiting academics and, and others. Um, and quite important for people who perhaps were looking to come here, new appointments, and needed six months or a year to, to search for a home for themselves. Uh, because London obviously became vastly more expensive in, uh, in my time here, that 10 years, uh, property prices rose enormously. Well, I, I suppose one thing where I started something off and it has not survived, which I regret. Um, I'm a historian by, by training and, and inclination. And 
I felt very strongly that we needed a, an effective record, a basic statement of fact, not um, uh, sort of propaganda, not, not um, big fancy write-ups or anything. I mean, that, that had its place elsewhere. So I introduced the idea of the Gazette. And this was a simple factual statement of appointments, resignations, promotions, um, research grants, and so on. And it, it, to my delight, survived for a good many years after my departure, but has since been abandoned. Um, what I know about it, partly it means there is a really good factual record for somebody to look at in the future, which I thought was important, and which I could never lay my hands on. You had to go through a mass of papers to get some of these things. Um, but I happen to know, because I was often told by colleagues, with it, it was in fact an awesome record. And people in other universities looked at this uh, with great envy and I had my opposite numbers in other universities saying to me, my vast ch vice chancellor has been on to me saying, why can't we have lists of grants like this and so on? <laughs> what did you do this for? And I, I think it was probably uh, one of the best ways in a very uh, understated fashion of showing the world just how good Imperial was, and no doubt is without the record. I suppose you ask about inventions. The, uh, the, in a way, the, the forerunner of uh, the medical mergers, and very significant in that the person involved actually chaired the, the committee when we, um, between St Mary's and Imperial, when we, we got together, uh, Alan Swanson, of course, designed the uh, first artificial hip. Uh, as a mechanical engineer. It was a mechanical engineer's hip. And that was very new science uh, in, in those days. And uh, now, you know, um, so many people have had hip replacements, and uh, several of them sometimes, that it's, it's commonplace, but it wasn't. I mean, it was a hip replacement was as rare as a PC when I came to Imperial. <laughs> Something I'd like to say, which I believe to be extremely important, and whether it's still true of the college or not, I don't know. Uh, but when I arrived, in all my time here, I was very much moved by the extraordinary loyalty of many of the non-academic staff. Um, people in quite humble jobs, some of them. Uh, messengers, for example. And I can remember I was here with the great storm of October 1987, living in, in Prince's Gardens. And uh, I realized things were bad. And I came over at about three o'clock in the morning. And a very hairy journey it was, because there were sheets of pan hurtling around and so on. I felt I was lucky not to be decapitated. And there were the night security staff coping as best they could and I, I stayed around and next morning many people just said well it's not worth going in but amazing the number of the most humble staff who with immense difficulty came in and there was a, a young messenger I remember on on duty Telephones were, were failing and all the rest of it, but while the telephones were still working, he was fielding calls from parents all over the country, world in fact, um, without any support from anyone senior, and he did it extremely well. And I, I had great respect for them. I always made it my uh, habit to, I always used to come in on Christmas Day when the college was open, um, bring some mince pies and grog to the, to the messengers and cheer them up as there they were. That was their Christmas. And I think it's very easy for a big institution like this 
to forget the, the devotion uh, of some of these uh, people. And uh, they're, they're ones I remember very well. And I still exchange Christmas cards with my delightful Spanish cleaner. <laughs> and all, all our cleaners in those days were Spanish ladies, mainly living in Shepherd's Bush. And mine's now back in Spain. And I uh, remember her very well, delightful person. And um, I used to just see her briefly in the morning, most mornings. And, uh, you know, there she is, still communicating, which is very, very nice. Yes, always featured large on the college secretary's agenda. Uh, the Knightsbridge Association was uh, powerful, uh, had lots of very um, well-known public figures as members, and on the whole objected to having students in their, in their midst. And we used to have constant battles, particularly with the people living in the mews behind uh, the Prince's Gardens residences. Um, but uh, we also were able to fight back in some ways and uh, we, the college uh, crosses two constituency boundaries and the City of London boundary in which Prince's Gardens is uh, was fortunate in having Peter Brook as uh, its MP and Peter was an extremely good friend of the college, uh, would always answer an invitation from students or, or, or the college in fact and uh, was many an occasion and uh, that helped e enormously having that um, that link um, and we did work out on one occasion that if every student living in the constituency registered for a vote we could probably have um, change the course of history, certainly in terms of local elections, if not national elections. Um, but uh, m when I lived in Prince's Gardens, I was constantly getting calls and people complaining and so on. It, it was difficult. I, I, I accept it was difficult for them, but it was equally difficult for us. Um, and then at Silver Park, we also had a <coughs> an equivalent Ascot Association which was very nervous about any development at Silver Park. Uh, but I, I settled them largely by having a meeting and saying, well, if you won't let us do anything, we're not going to stay. And I suspect you will find this turned into some vast great housing estate because uh, it's prime land in a prime position and however much you oppose it, ultimately somebody will get planning consent. And that eased things there and enabled considerable development at Silver Park. And uh, I probably had more to do with that than, uh, than with development anywhere else in the college. And we, we did student residences. There's the Brian and Mary Flowers uh, Hall and uh, the John Smith Hall, um, uh, as well as the, the Science Park. And I enjoyed that uh, very much because it did, um, did help Silwood along the way. Although, curiously enough, there was a lot of opposition from some of the academics at Silwood Park who just didn't like change and they wanted it to be in the nice, quiet, cosy place it, it had been. Um, but I felt we either had to do something with it or, or dispose of it because it was costing a lot of money and uh, needed to be used. Uh, something I, I recall with uh, pleasure uh, was our relationship with the 1851 Commission. Um, a lot of people are always surprised to know that there was a, a national event that actually made money and here we are, you know, um, a century and a half later pretty well and it's still um, uh, involved and handing out money and um, doing a great job. And of course, the 1851 Commission are landlords of a large part of the college, um, which very unwisely, uh, they uh, gave a 999 year lease without any uh, clause for renegotiating at a peppercorn rent. 
um, which is why the college has been able to survive in, in this very high-valued part of London. And when I arrived, the 1851 commission with whom I made acquaintance lived on the other side of Prince Consort Road at the junction with Exhibition Road. And um, while I was here, there was, uh, they were debating what to do with their particular property, which they thought they could use commercially. So I suggested, what about coming here? It pleased me to think that we might have our landlords as our tenants. And also, I thought very appropriate that the 1851 Commission should live with the archives. And uh, lo and behold, that came to pass and seems to have worked very well ever since. And I, I'm delighted that, uh, that it did so.